Season 2, Episode 17. Today we are continuing our Lessons from the Wilderness series with a look at some case studies for Joshua and the slow model. Hello, Father. Hello, daughter. Good to be with you. It is good to be with you. Um, today we have a lot to cover, so I'm doing rapid fire icebreaker, no explanation. Okay? Fruit salad or veggie salad? Uh, fruit salad. Veggie salad. All right. All right. Tell us in the comments. Are you fruit salad or veggie salad? Because <laughs> he made a song about fruit salad. Yummy, know. yummy. <laughs> okay. <laughs> fruit salad is good. Okay. No explanation. <laughs> Last episode, we talked about Joshua as a model for the victorious Christian life. Today, we are looking at case studies for um, as we follow Joshua through these various battles, especially these four core battles. Right. Um, did they use the slow model to follow this trust plus obey equals victor- victory? Victory. Um, <laughs> did they did they follow the model or didn't they? Um, because God sets out this formula for victory, which we've been discussing, trust plus obey, trust plus obey, um, trust me and obey me and you will be victorious. And how do you do this? You stop and seek, you listen, you obey, and then you get to watch what happens. So you have a new acrostic for us that you, you sneak peeked, I think last episode, and that is Josh. Josh, (laughs) there it is. No joshing around. All right. So the, uh, uh, there is in, uh, you know, uh, technical terms, a chiastic structure to the first part of jo- uh, Joshua. And uh, it starts with God giving him the formula for success, right? Meditate on my word, obey what I say, and you'll see victory, which we're meditating on God's word to, to build our faith so that we remember to obey so that he can give the success and victory promises. So that is the establishment. Then there are two battle. Then there's a, uh, a a major battle that they win, and then there is a battle where they forget, right, to seek God, listen, and obey. They don't follow the slow model. They don't seek God, listen, obey, and watch what happens. And so, and then they in the middle. So it's it's the formula is given. And then there's these two, uh, a big battle where they win, a small battle that they should have won that they lose. And then there is a, at the center of this chiasm, they are at the, at Shechem where there are two mountains. And these two mountains represent the covenant. And it is, uh, uh, mountain number one represents the blessings that come with obedience. And mountain number two represents the curses that come when you disobey. And there they rededicate themselves to the original formula. We will trust, we will obey, we will do things your way and trust you to to provide. So they come back from that. And then immediately they have an inferior enemy that they don't seek, listen, obey, and watch. So um, the battle at Ai, for example, is parallel to the battle at Gibeon. And then uh, they have a, a major battle where they do all these things and they win. So... I know that's complicated, especially if you can't see it, but can, you've got... Can you explain, so once you're done with that overview, the... What, what the Josh is? Well, yes, well. but the... A chiasm, what is the point of a chiasm? Okay, so, yeah. So the uh, point of a chiasm is that uh, we outline things with like Roman numeral, A, you know, one, two, three, A, B, C, that sort of thing. That didn't exist when they wrote the Bible. So the one thing you can be sure of is that the biblical authors did not Roman numeral outline their uh, what they were doing. One of the more common organizational strategies is called a chiasm, and that's where you, it's usually like A, B, C, C, B, A kind of thing. Like A is par- this A is parallel to this A, this B is parallel to this B. So in Joshua, what you have is an A, B, C, D, followed by C, B, A. Now, What chiasms tend to do is they tend to emphasize what's at the beginning and the end, and they tend to emphasize what's in the middle. So it is not uncommon in something chiastic that the thing that is in the middle is the core message that the author is trying to communicate. So here what we have is that the beginning of the chiasm is instructions that say, trust the Lord, obey him, do things his way, and you'll be successful. In the middle of the chiasm is 
the Shechem covenant ceremony where they are dedicating themselves to do this. And at the end of the chiasm, we don't have it, but what we do have is a list of 32 battles that they win, <laughs> <laughs> right? And the idea that they, they have now done it, and what we see is they are now 32-0. and 0. They just beat all of these kings, and we have this, this list of kings who were defeated. So it starts with the promise, and then it ends with the fulfillment. Mm-hmm. And so that's the, the anchors of this chiasm. And then you get the next step in, Battle of Jericho, which is then parallel to the Battle of Hatzor, which are two major cities where they obeyed God and they saw great victories. And then you've got the Battle of Ai, paralleled with the Battle of Gibeon, both of which were small and shouldn't have been a big problem, but they didn't seek God, therefore they couldn't trust him, therefore they couldn't obey, and it turned into a problem. So you get these parallel things happening in there. Now... That's the chiasm part of it. Okay, and now for Josh. Okay, so Josh, I uh, used to teach my students back uh, back in the 80s when we were teaching this stuff. Uh, they could remember the four battles um, as Jericho for J. O is overtime at AI. And the idea is like they didn't lose the battle of AI, but they had to go into overtime to win. So overtime at AI. S is sun stands still, right? So the sun stands still, which allowed them to win the, the Battle of Gibeon, which frankly was a battle they never should have had to fight, right? Well, we'll get into that. So J is Jericho, O, overtime at AI, S, sun stands still at Gibeon, and then H is hot sore. Now, hot sore may be the biggest battle that nobody's ever heard of. So we'll, uh, we'll talk about that, that more later. But J- hot sore was actually significantly larger and significantly more powerful than Jericho. It was a climax of battle and epicness. If it was filmed, oh my goodness. Anyway, uh, but we digress. So we have two times when they slowed Jericho and Hatsor. So they they defeated a superior enemy. Then we have two times when they did not slow at and so again, the idea of so is stop, listen, obey, watch. And, you, and if you do it, you get to see what God does. When you don't stop and seek God, you can't listen. Therefore, you can't obey. And you also get to watch what happens. And so, yes, in the mm-hmm. two big battles, they stopped, they sought the Lord, they obeyed, and they watched God do something miraculous. In the two what should have been small battles, they did not do this. Mm-hmm. And because they didn't stop to seek God, they didn't listen for his strategy. Therefore, they couldn't obey. And both things ended up being much harder than they should have been. All right. So let's dig straight into quick highlights from Jericho. So Jericho, uh, highlight number one, right, is Rahab. And mm-hmm. uh, so uh, this is one of these ironic things. Like you got the two spies staying in the house of a prostitute, which, of course, raises a, you know ethical issues of its own, but it's good cover. It's good military strategy. Nobody's going to be surprised that two foreign men would go there. Um, what is truly surprising is that uh, Rahab becomes a model of faith. Like she is the one who reports to them, everybody here is terrified of you. Mm-hmm. And specifically, they're terrified of your God, mm-hmm. right? They know, you know, they, they heard what your God did to the Egyptians. They've heard what your God has done. Nobody has ever seen a God like yours that fights like this. And she's like, in fact, I'd like to... You know, mm-hmm. I, I, I'm drawn to your God. I would, uh, you know, I trust him more than I trust our gods. Please protect me. <laughs> yeah, please protect me. And so and my family. out of faith in God, you know, without any moral transformation or anything like this, this is an example of salvation by faith alone, mm-hmm. right? By faith alone, apart from works, she was saved because she said, I'm putting my, my trust in your God uh, as being... Uh, greater than ours. So that that's the beginning of it. Um, related to emotional healing, too, with uh, Rahab is this thought that, you know, you run into a lot of women who've been sexually abused, and I've heard the word slut a lot. Like, I feel like a slut. I feel like I'm horrible. I feel like I'm dirty is the other word. Like, I, and I don't feel like I'll ever be clean again. Well, I think Rahab is kind of that almost like the patron saint, right, of women who have had to go through sexual trauma uh, that God redeemed. Mm -hmm. And uh, while patron saint is not necessarily the the correct term to use, it's the idea that she she is a metaphor or a type of of women who have had to go through sexual trauma, who had an identity formed around that that God redeemed and gave to whom He gave a new new identity, 
And she became not only uh, a member of the Hall of Faith in the book of Hebrews, but a member of the line of the Messiah. And it looks pretty clearly, there's some scholarly debate about this, but they, it looks pretty clearly like she is in, um, uh, that it was her son who married Ruth, mm-hmm. right? And so you, you begin to see these things come together. We actually paused the break to look this up because we were both so curious, right? <laughs> we is, make sure right, we got that make right. Make sure we got this right. So here I am in Matthew chapter 1 going through the genealogy, and it says here that Salmon, well, not to be not the fish, but Salmon fathered Boaz by Rahab, which, uh, so the debate is, is this really the same Rahab? But there's, I don't think there's a strong reason why it wouldn't be that's a very well-known character to people so Boab, boaz then is um the son of rahab and that is interesting then that boaz was predisposed to be willing to marry a foreigner because his mother was a foreigner and so uh we have ruth then becomes the mother of obed who becomes the father of jesse and david so you got literally ruth obed jesse david so ruth is the great grandmother of david which makes Rahab, the great great grandmother of David, is very, you know, it's right yeah, there. Yeah. So there she is. So Ray, yeah. Rahab is one of these fascinating characters here that's worth mm-hmm. a little attention. Yeah. No, oh, very, very good. All right. Any other highlights from Jericho that you want to bring up, especially in relation maybe to the slow model or. Well, again, um, I think victory. our point here was like, yeah. so sometimes we stop and seek God and sometimes God stops us. Mm-hmm. And Jericho was one of those cases where God stopped Joshua and the angel of the Lord literally showed up in full battle armor and was like, uh, hello. <laughs> <laughs> and Joshua was like, uh, hi, hi, how are you? <laughs> and no, but you know, he, he was terrified. He's like, well, whose side are you on? And he goes, yeah, wrong question. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Right, and that's that. There's something just genius about the whole thing. That when God, there's a principle here: when God fights, God wins. Mm-hmm. So we need to make sure we're on God's side. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Right, and that's really what it boils down to. It's not how do I get God to fight for me. Mm-hmm. It's how do I make sure that I am fighting God's battles and I'm on His side and what we're doing. Mm-hmm. So in this case, God literally stopped Joshua, and. Uh, said, here, listen to me. I'm mm-hmm. telling you what I want you to do, which may have been needed in this case because what he wanted was so radical, right? And that is, I want you to march around this place once every day, six times on the last day, 13 times we're marching around the city. Did I say it's right, six? It's, it's six times and then seven on the last day. So 13 total times. And uh, we don't know why. A lot of people guessed that there was some you know, occult reason for this, taking back, you know, some kind of rituals. But I, it was a, uh, the reality is, it's what he was told to do. He obeyed and God gave them the victory. Mm-hmm. And so we don't you, always have to understand why God says to do something. Right. We just obey because yeah. we know he understands why. Yeah. All right. Well, let's move along to highlights from the heap of ruins, <laughs> from, from, AI or IE or however we want to pronounce it. Yes, that. we looked up the and, uh, the AI. I've always been like, how do you actually pronounce this? So we found out a couple IE. of interesting things. First of all, the uh, town of I I I I is kind of say I almost British. Anyway, I the uh, and then you put an H sound in front of it I, uh, which is interesting because um, that word in Hebrew means a heap. Or, or the or if, if you're and when you put the, the h, h and when yeah. you put the the h sound in front of it becomes the heap, mm-hmm. which leads to the idea that either either it's saying there's the town of Bethel and then there are there's ruins uh, near it called you know which is the heap, mm-hmm. or um, another town had been built on these ruins and mm-hmm. so there were two towns there. It doesn't mm-hmm. really matter. The point here uh, that's just total curiosity, <laughs> right? So the. Uh, um, but it's funny, they're having this, to go over time. At, I think my one of my professors one time was like, oh, yeah, the dump. You know? The dump, <laughs> yes. He calls uh, AI the dump because it means the heap. So, yes, but this is where we have Achan and his rebellion. And Achan, there Achan. you go with your Hebrew. I'm sorry. Achan. That also Nobody got... knows it by that... Achan. It's Achan to the Americans. Okay. I'm sorry. Yes. That one got, I can't, I, it's like physically painful to say Achan now because of a class I was in. I know, and we it's had like to just water train. and water. I get Achan, it. Achan, no, okay. yeah. Ach, Achan and Achan. <laughs> I'm sorry. All right. Can, what do you want to say about this? <laughs> 
<laughs> well, you know, Aiken again becomes a metaphor and archetype. So mm-hmm. if and for if, those who don't remember who he is, are you well, explaining him? I'll get there. Okay. So Ray Rahab is an archetype of like sexually traumatized women, and also of salvation by faith apart from works and all these things. Aiken or Aha, right? Is a uh, he is a metaphor or the archetype of those who are seduced by the world and by the love of the world. And so there was a clear decree from God that Jericho was to be placed under something called harem. Mm -hmm. All right. Now harem, there you go. Get your guttural (laughs) in there. Uh, It's interesting. The word it sounds most like is harem. Right. Well, it, and I'm pretty it, sure it has an, a, a, the root to that Arabic. Yes, root, they yeah. are. They are basically related words from the similar from the same root. And the idea is like a harem is women who are devoted to the king and belong to him only. And if you touch them, touched you... one of them, you were killed. Mm-hmm. So in the same way, so when God said the city of Jericho is harem to me, mm-hmm. it means it is devoted to me. It belongs to me. If you take any of this, you forfeit your life because it's mine. Right. And so what that meant specifically was that if it was a living, it became a sacrifice. If it wasn't living, it went into the ta- and went into the treasury. Mm-hmm. So when Achan uh, goes into Jericho, he sees... You know, this beautiful Mesopotamian robe, he sees some gold. So his love of the world takes over, right? And it is, he has, the like First John talks about the lust of the eye, the pride of life, right? He was, uh, he saw this stuff, he said, I'm going to get rich and nobody will ever know. So the problem here is that he has to include his family in this because he hides it in his tent, right? Which means other people are helping him hide the secret and... Uh, they go through a trial. Now, this is not a normal trial that follows like, here's a detective and all the, you know, uh, evidence. This is a, God is putting you on trial, trial, right? We're Mm -hmm. casting lots. And at each step along the way, Aiken and his family have an opportunity to come clean and nobody does. And so finally at the end, God puts the finger on him and said, it's, it's you. And there's a reason why he and his whole family are put to death. One, they have uh, stolen from God. They have violated the highest level of violation that uh, you can do in terms of stealing. And uh, the whole family is in on it. And so they are executed. And that is called purging, right? That they were purged from the land. The evil was taken away. And uh, as a result, uh, they were able to go back to AI. And now they seek God and say, what is it you want to do? Now they follow slow. They seek God, they listen, they obey, and they get to watch what happens Mm -hmm. as they uh, win a complete victory now. Uh, They have to go to overtime, but they win in overtime at AI. And then they rededicate themselves to that core proposition we were talking about. Yeah. So, So, yeah. And then do you want to go over to the parallel of of Gibeon and... and Yeah, so... um, so we talked about, you know, chiastically how uh, the story of AI and Gibeon are parallel because both of them are inferior groups that they sh- then because they were inferior, they didn't think they needed to seek God's advice. They just handled it. Now, with Gibeon, they came disguising themselves as if they were from a, a distant country and they made a, uh, a covenant with Israel. Now, Israel had been specifically forbidden from making covenants with the local people. And so um, these folks disguised themselves. Now, to understand fully the impact of this, you got to think of it in modern terms. Uh, you know, right now, Israel has a lot of enemies like Hamas and Hezbollah who, who don't want them to exist. And you can imagine, like, if there was one of them that pivoted and said, you know what, we're going to go make an alliance with Israel. Like, all of the others would like, no, 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 no. And they, they would attack them. You know, not just would they be upset with Israel. Now they'd be upset with whoever reversed mm-hmm. policy and became friends. And so that's what happened with Gibeon. The rest of the Canaanite nations declared war on them and said, no, we cannot have anybody defecting and befriending Israel. So um, five kings formed an alliance and attacked Gibeon. Israel's now in alliance with Gibeon, and uh, they have to come to their rescue, and they find themselves in a battle. 
Joshua does seek the Lord this time. He does obey, and they are winning the battle. And this is that that famous battle where uh, Joshua's like, I'm running out of time. We can get a complete victory if we just have more time. And he prays that the sun stands still, right? And it does, and God gives him a complete victory. And so this is that famous battle where the sun stands still. And I just find it fascinating in that context that, like, so God shows up to honor the covenant that, Israel has made and to help Israel, even though they shouldn't have made that covenant in the first place, but he still redeems the situation. Um, And, and they were operating on the second part of that with slow, just like we saw with AI that, um, yeah, Yeah. we, we, they, they, they fumble it in the beginning and then, and then they remember to seek God and, and do things his way and things work out. Yeah. So in both cases, God was merciful and yeah, very good. All right, do you want to get to Hatsor? Yeah, so Hatsor is his most famous battle nobody's ever heard of. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> the city of Hatsor is located north of the Sea of Galilee uh, along a little body of water called Lake Merom. And it was the capital city of a large coalition of kingdoms. And throughout many centuries, it was a uh, important city that was often uh, the royal city over a large, um, a large group of people. In Joshua's day, it was probably the largest city in Canaan. Uh, it was much larger. Archaeology has shown us is much larger than Jericho. And uh, in this case, as with Jericho, Joshua stopped. He sought the Lord, he listened, he obeyed, and they won a complete and total victory over the city. In fact, it's told that the city was set on fire and it was not rebuilt for, for a long time afterwards. Now, interestingly, in Judges, Deborah finds ends up fighting uh, this same city. Uh, is That famous story also involves this city. So it does get rebuilt and it does once again become an, uh, an important capital city, which just tells you how uh, you know important this was. So we get the parallel. Um, mm-hmm. Big battles with Jericho, big battles with Hot Sore, but because they seek the Lord, they listen, they obey, they uh, get decisive victories. Very good. So then let's move into a little bit of application. Um, implications for healing journey or even just as we're studying scripture and practicing our own slow, what, what can we learn? So one of the lessons we learn is that God is a God of redemption, that he, we can make mistakes <laughs> and uh, it isn't the end of the world. I think, you know, in my own journey, uh, I often struggled uh, with anxiety and I realized that underneath the anxiety was shame. Mm-hmm. Like when I would mess up and I knew it was my fault, Um, I felt like I couldn't count on God to come through to take care of me. After all, I deserved, Mm -hmm. you know, Mm -hmm. or I've made my own bed, it's time to lay in it Mm -hmm. kind of thing. And it's not that there aren't consequences to behavior, but for us as Christians, our story is never a story of ruin. It is always a story of redemption. And that's an important lesson that we uh, we take from here as well. Whether it's Rahab or whether it was the messing up... uh, with Achan and AI or the, or the, you know, what happened with Gibeon, God didn't abandon his people. It wasn't the end of the story. There were consequences, but he still came through for them. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's really good. Um, and then I know you've also talked about just the duh factor <laughs> when yes. we're reading, when we're reading the scriptures and you see these patterns over and over again, you see the models enacted and you're supposed to just, you, you get to the point when you're reading the Bible and Something happens and you're like, well, duh, what did you think was going to happen? Exactly. I have a whole lesson actually (laughs) uh, called the duh factor. And it's what happens when you read the Bible long enough and you see people start to do something and you're like, what are they thinking? Don't they know that? (laughs) Why are they doing this? Why would they go worship the Baals? Why would Mm -hmm. they? And, And you find yourself going, well, duh, what did they think was going to happen? So that's the duh factor. And that means that you're reading the Bible correctly, right? Mm -hmm. The Bible is trying to get you to begin to internalize this feeling like there is, there's a right way to live life. Mm -hmm. And as we live life that way, we can expect God to bless. Doesn't mean there won't be battles, but there are victory in these battles. Mm -hmm. And so, um, yeah, we call that the duh factor. It's like, well, duh, what did you think was going to happen? So, Yeah. yeah. That's why it's so important to stay in it so you can recognize the patterns and see it and build up that duh factor. (laughs) It's why biblical meditation is so important. Exactly. 
Um, and then another lesson that you and I have talked about is this idea of competency and prayer life scales and um, mm-hmm. how we see sometimes, you know, you, you see when people think, oh, I've got this. This is, you know, been here, done that. Uh, right. And I'll just do it my way or uh, leaning on my own accumulative knowledge and understanding um or strength yeah no i it makes me think of a uh, i was at a banquet once i heard uh, bruce wilkinson speaking back when he was the uh, president of walk through the bible and he had just written prayer of jabez and all he was talking about how common it was for ministers when they first get into the ministry they don't have much competence. They don't have a lot of experience. They're praying over everything. They're just, you know, God, please make this sermon work. You know, please, God, give me, you know, what I need for this to, to happen. And they're, they're so they're high on intimacy with God. They're low on competence. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but as you spend decades in ministry, your competence goes up. You know how to do this. You can pre, you know, you can prep a sermon mm-hmm. pretty, you know, it, it's like clockwork. You know yeah. how to do it. You know what it's going to take. You go through it. You can... And all aspects of ministry, this can begin to happen where you don't rely on prayer as much. And so what happens is you stop practicing slow. You're not seeking God. You're not stopping. You're not listening. You're not going through that process. And not only does it uh, affect the success of of what's going on, but it's a great recipe for burnout. Mm -hmm. Because if I am relying on my own competence and I am not seeking God on a regular basis, I am going to burn out because I'm trying to do ministry in my own strength. It's not a good recipe. Yeah, that is a good word, a good challenge. And we next next episode, we're going to be wrapping up the whole the whole series for this episode. Do you have any final thought you want to leave us with? Well, you know, I do think that uh, the, the, the core idea of these case studies is is that the Bible often does this. We see it again in Chronicles. We see it in other places where it'll give us a thesis and then it'll give us case studies to prove the thesis. And this, in the book of Joshua, that thesis is you need to meditate on God's word like that lanyard. You need to obey and watch what happens. So we talk about it. I stop, I seek, I listen, I obey, I watch. And, uh, and then we get to see when you put it into practice, no matter how big the battle, no matter how big the enemy, you can trust God to come through. Huzzah. Very good. Thank you. Thanks for joining us on the trail today. Did you like this episode? Would you like more people to see it? This is the part where I ask you to like, comment, subscribe, share with a friend. And do you love this channel? One of the best ways that you can support us is by becoming a Deeper Walk Trailblazer. Thanks again. We'll see you back on the trail next week.